How are you? Good to see you. Glad you're here. Yeah. How are you? Nice to see Barry Moore. And I'm a partner in crime. That's what I was going to do, but I... I Thanks for inviting us. Great to see you. It's 10 o'clock and time to get started, so good morning everyone. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to today's hearing. Uh, we look forward to hearing your views. As you know, last week the Science and Technology Committee held the first hearing in Congress on the just released report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Control, the IPCC. That hearing provided a useful glimpse into the current scientific understanding of climate change. It's clear that the advances in our scientific understanding of climate change are critically dependent on the data collection and modeling enabled by our investments in the earth science research and applications at NOAA and NASA. In addition, those investments play a crucial role in proving the accuracy of our weather forecast, monitoring land use, and managing our natural resources. In short, this nation needs to continue to invest in robust systems of environmental satellites. Two witnesses, or rather two years ago, one of, of today's witnesses, Dr. Moore, stated that the interim report of the National Academy's Decadal Survey had concluded that the nation's system of environmental satellites was, and I quote, at risk of collapse. That was a sobering assessment. Now the Decadal Survey is finished and we will be hearing their findings and recommendations today. One of those findings in particular is troubling and once again I quote, in the short period since the publication of the interim report, budgetary constraints and programmatic difficulties at NASA have greatly exacerbated this concern. At a time of unprecedented need, the nation's Earth ob observation satellite programs once the envy of the world or in disarray. I don't think the National Academies could be clearer than in voicing its concern. So at today's hearing, I want to get answers to the following questions. When the Decadal Survey Panel says that the nation's Earth observation satellite programs are in disarray, what does that mean in specific terms? What is the impact of that disarray, and why does it matter? and what needs to be done to fix this situation. Of course, in these times of tight budgets, some will look at the Academy's recommendations and simply say, we can't afford to do more than we are now. However, the simple fact of the matter is that our nation is getting ready to spend a lot of money to deal with climate change in the coming years, both public dollars and private dollars. We will continue to need good data to make sure that those investments are wise ones and that we're getting the intended results. I'm worried that we're going to be flying blind if we don't ensure that the nation's environmental satellite system is up to the task of collecting critical climate science 
data. And the decadal survey is sounding the alarm that unless we take steps to reverse the current trend or decline, we are going to have the satellite system we need in the coming decade. And we've got a lot to discuss today, so I want to welcome our witnesses, and now I want to recognize Ranking Member Hall for any remarks that he would like to make. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for calling today's hearing to examine the recently released decadal survey on Earth sciences produced by the National Academies. Uh, this report, which provides strategic advice to the government on the scope and goals of future Earth observing missions, especially those flown by NASA and NOAA, will be great uh, help to guide uh, federal investment uh, decisions now and, and in the years ahead of us. I want to begin by thanking Dr. Anthes and Dr. Moore and all your colleagues that served uh, with you on the National Academies Committee. Drafting the first ever such report could not have been easy, uh, but I'm certain that the community is stronger, and I thank you for it, and perhaps more cohesive as a result. And I, I hope you'll tell your friends and colleagues that we're grateful for their very hard work. Uh, Governor Geringer, thank you for taking time from your busy schedule today to, to describe how remote sensing data and products are used by industry and government. I want to add parenthetically that in my state of Texas and for many residents in the western states, monitoring and measuring drought conditions is rapidly gaining importance. During the last uh, Congress, I was able to work with my friends here in the House uh, to draft and pass a bill establishing the National Integrated Drought Information System, and I'm glad that the President agreed to sign it into law. But having said that, to many in this room, uh, weather forecasting products are about all we understand. Government, uh, we look forward to your uh, testimony and those of you who ran your governments about the numerous other applications of remote sensing information. Beyond articulating the science questions and missions, the survey challenges the government to reassess the amount of funding dedicated to earth science. It urges government to increase investment in NASA's Earth Sciences program by $500 million a year, about a 33% increase over current levels. This presents the administration and Congress with a tremendous challenge. It's no mystery to everyone in this room that NASA is struggling to afford its current slate of programs from human space flight to aeronautics, astrophysics, planetary sciences, and re redirecting funding uh, from any of these activities is not an option. Uh, we need all of them. Either NASA maintains a status quo with perhaps marginal adjustments in content uh, to its Earth Sciences program, or, or its top-line funding uh, should be increased. And I, I strongly prefer the latter. I think that's what we have to do. We have to increase these fundings. The report also recommends new missions for NOAA that would total $565 million over the next 10 years. I hope the witnesses will help us understand what weather forecasting improvements these missions would provide and why the decadal survey recommends them. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I do want to be clear. Uh, I support the decadal survey and its recommendations. It lays out a course of research that should be followed. It raises questions that are of immediate importance to our way of living, and if truly implemented, it will provide planning tools that will help future generations monitor and mitigate the effect of changes to Earth's weather systems. Unfortunately, in the current budget climate, I fear we cannot fully implement the recommendations, and in that vein, I intend to ask hard questions today about which of the recommendations and missions are most important. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Hall. I, I ask unanimous consent that all additional opening statements be submitted by the committee members be included in the record. Without Mr. Sensenbrenner's objection, so ordered. We are fortunate to have three distinguished witnesses at today's hearing. Oh, you're <laughs> <laughs> he wants you to follow. Uh, I will now yield to Representative Udall to introduce the first witness. Okay, me <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, it's uh, my privilege to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Richard Anthes today. He's the president of the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, otherwise known as UCAR, a nonprofit consortium of 70 member universities that award PhDs in atmospheric and related sciences. He's the co-chair of the National Research Council's Earth Science Decadal Survey. Dr. Anthes is a highly regarded atmospheric scientist, author, educator, and administrator 
who has contributed considerable research to the field. He's published over 100 peer-reviewed articles and books and participated on or chaired over 400, excuse me, 40 different U.S. national committees. Dr. Anthes is currently president of the American Meteorological Society. His many research contributions uh, involve uh, particularly the areas of tropical cyclones and mesoscale meteorology, including the development of the first successful three-dimensional model of the tropical cyclone which evolved into one of the world's most widely used mesoscale models, the Penn State NCAR mesoscale model, which is now in its fifth generation. Welcome, Dr. Anthes. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Udall. I don't think I've ever been introduced by a congressman before. Um, and well, that saves me uh, 30 seconds of my five minutes. Um, I would like to start out If with you don't mind, sir, let us go ahead and we'll uh, recognize the other witnesses oh, okay. and then we'll, okay. we'll begin with you. But you're correct. You were well introduced there. Uh, our second witness is Dr. Uh, Barry Ann Moore, who is the other co-chair of the National Academy's Decadal Survey. Dr. Moore is a professor and director of the Institute for the Studies of Earth, Oceans, and Space at the University of, of New Hampshire. Welcome. Our third witness is former Wyoming Governor, Dr. Jim, I mean, rather, Jim uh, Geringer. Uh, governor Geringer has been very active in the Alliance for Earth Observations, excuse me. and he was the force behind the Western Governors Association call for a national <coughs> integrated drought information system. I want to welcome each of you and look forward to your testimony. You will each be given five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. Uh, with um, uh, my friend Mr. Robacher's indulgence, I will say that we'll try to be liberal with your five minutes because this is very important and uh, we want to hear from you. Uh, when all three of you have completed your testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. Doctor, we'll begin with you. Hey, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Ranking Minority Member, and members of the committee. Thanks for inviting us uh, to testify here today. I'd like, uh, this is one of my favorite rooms in the whole world because of that, uh, the, the uh, statement, where there is no vision, the people perish from Proverbs 29, 18. I think that is what we need to keep our eye on, not the individual observations, not the individual dollars, but we really do need uh, a vision for earth science and applications from space. And I, uh, I, I just love that saying, it's perf perfect lead in. Our vision from our decadal survey uh, is uh, carried over actually from the, from the interim report. And I wanna read it to you. I, th I think it's very important, I believe in it deeply. Understanding the complex changing planet on which we live, how it supports life, and how human activities affect its ability to do so in the future is one of the greatest intellectual challenges facing humanity. It's also one of the most important challenges for society as it seeks to achieve prosperity, health, and sustainability. So this is the dual message, the dual vision of our report, that understanding the Earth is one of the most exciting intellectual challenges we can, we can think of. And it's also critically important for applications of immediate and long-term benefit to humanity. As detailed in our report and further emphasized by the latest uh, issue of the IPCC, which came out a couple of weeks ago, our society is faced with a number of profound scientific and societal challenges, including climate change and all of the aspects of, of, of the climate change that uh, is occurring at an unprecedented rate. And yet at a time when the need has never been greater, we're faced with an Earth observation program that will dramatically diminish in capability over the next five to 10 years. As you mentioned already, our interim report said that the system of U.S. environmental satellites was at risk of collapse. This judgment was based on the observed precipitous decline in funding uh, and the consequent cancellation, descoping, and delay of a number of critical missions and instruments. By the way, let me interject here, deviate from my prepared talk a little bit. This is not primarily about money and decreasing budgets. It's primarily about doing the job that needs to be done for society. And the modest investments that are required will repay themselves many times over. So please focus on the benefits to society, the intellectual challenges, and what we're proposing is a balanced system rather than uh, the uh, declining budgets. So I've been asked, you know, what will we lose if we don't do what the decadal survey uh, mentions? And I think my colleague, Dr. Moore, will give some examples, but let me just 
give you uh, some examples which are not really in the in the uh, in the uh, survey. Uh, weather forecasts and warnings may start becoming less accurate. We've seen a tr tremendous run-up of increased accuracy in weather forecasts and warnings over the last 30 years, primarily because of uh, Earth observations from space. The Hurricane Katrina forecast was incredibly accurate, saving perhaps 100,000 lives, uh, one of the few bright spots in that whole tragic episode. But we're actually in danger, if the observations continue to decrease, of losing uh, that, uh, uh, that improving weather forecast and warning capability. Very serious. Earth is warming because of a small imbalance in radiation between the sun and the earth. Very small difference between two very large terms. What's coming in from the sun, a huge number, what's going back out to space. We need to measure that small imbalance very accurately. We need to measure what's coming in from the sun and what's going out from the earth so that we know uh, whether the earth is going to warm up faster, whether it's going to slow down and it's warming up, and finally, when we reach a new equilibrium and there's no more change. Climate models have improved steadily over the past years, but they're far from perfect. They don't do very well on regional scales, which is what we're really interested in. Is the dry dryness in the West going to continue? Uh, are hurricanes be going to become more frequent or, or more intense? Those kinds of things. So we need the observations to improve the climate models. We can never rely on models without observations. Sea level is rising and the earth, ice around the Earth is melting. But how fast? Is this going to accelerate? These things going to accelerate or decelerate, slow down. We've got to measure sea level and uh, the ice around the Earth, especially in Greenland. As I mentioned there's, there's controversy about whether the frequency and intensity of tropical storms or hurricanes is going to increase or decrease. We simply don't know. And without observations, uh, we won't be able to resolve that, that critical issue. And finally, Earth science is, is built fundamentally on observations, not theory and not models. And it will be, it's impossible for me to sit here and predict what discoveries won't be made in the next 20 years if we don't have observations. I can't do that, but I can surely say that if the present trend of decreasing observations continue, uh, we will, uh, the rate of scientific progress will be greatly slowed. So the plan we recommend calls for undertaking 17 new NASA and NOAA missions in the period 2008 to 2020, as well as restoring some of the capabilities lost on INPOS and GOES. Our recommendations for NASA can be implemented in a cost-effective manner. I think my colleague Dr. Moore will talk about this. We're merely to, to do the required program, and again, the repri required program is what's important, not the money. We need to simply restore the NASA uh, Earth Sciences budget to what it was five years ago. Finally, uh, implementing these missions will not only greatly reduce the risk to the people of our country in the world of natural hazards of all kinds, they will support more efficient management of natural resources, including water, energy, fisheries, ecosystems that support the economy uh, and our lives, and so that the cost of this program is repaid many times over. So thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to any questions that uh, you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time. Dr. Moore. Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking minority members and members of the committee, thank you inviting, uh, for inviting me to testify today. I'd like to repeat what uh, my colleague uh, Ricanti said. At a time when the need has never been greater, we're faced with an Earth observation program that will dramatically diminish in capability over the next five to ten years. Now we can ask, why did this occur? Simply stated, the NASA Earth Science budget declined in real terms by a third from the year 2000 to now. And as you well know, technical and managerial difficulties in the NPOST program offset the budget increases for NOAA's planned satellites over the same period. And regardless of where or whether blame is placed, we're still in the same situation. That's where we are. The survey set forth a strategy for a strong, balanced national program in earth science to reverse this trend. It recommends, as Rick said, that the nation commit to leadership in earth's observations in part through implementing a series of 17 missions carefully chosen to augment and replace our aging satellite fleet. The set of recommended 15 new missions to NASA may seem large numerically, but we believe 
that through focusing on smaller missions and avoiding large, multi-instrumented platforms, a robust strategy for the future of Earth science can be achieved with reasonable investments. As Rick Anthony's just said, the program could be restored uh, if we could just simply get back to the uh, year 2000 levels. I'd like to call attention to uh, what happened. Uh, it's in my written testimony to show this uh, 33% decline in real terms from 2000 to the present. What about the future? Is the President's FY08 budget adequately preparing us for the future? In short, no. The President's budget provides only a brief respite to a dramatically diminished observational system. The respite, lasting in, until 2010, does allow us to move forward with plans to measure global rainfall the Global Precipitation Mission, and general land cover characteristics to the Landsat. But by 2012, the budget will leave NASA's Earth science with nearly 50% less buying power uh, in comparison to the year 2000, and unable to pursue the critical topics just described by my colleague. The fall by 2012 will put us at a 20-year low in real terms for Earth science. NOAA's budget also appears to be inadequate to solve the cost of growth within the NPOs and goes our programs and to mitigate some of the NPOs losses by reinstating the solar and earth uh, radiation measurements, which, as Rick just said, are central to the climate system. Reinstating the high resolution measurements of the atmospheric ozone profiles, a key measurement to allow us to understand the post CFC era, and realizing an operation operational active radar-based uh, measurement of sea surface winds. Can anything be done now about the committee's recommendations for the next decade? Definitely yes. For instance, the survey presented a set of guidelines for managing the implementation of the new missions that included early uh, investments in technologies. This is an opportunity for the new decade starting now. NASA should consider investing $10 million per year per mission across the first half of the 15 missions. That takes an, an investment of $70 million. With that investment, we could actually begin to implement the decadal survey right now. It would also send a message that we're proceeding to develop the needed and recommended Earth observing program. Uh, these investments would avoid technological surprises that have plagued other programs. And I think that in itself uh, uh, is a reason to go forward with that kind of technology-based building. Now, how can we uh, justify uh, increasing resources in this time of particularly uh, difficult uh, budget issues, as Congressman Hall noted? I believe it's because of the benefits. More re reliable forecasts of infectious diseases, the identification of active faults and the monitoring of crustal movements to improve uh, building code designs in earthquake-prone regions. Uh, better weather forecasts, particularly for severe storms. Climate predictions based on better understanding of carbon sources and sinks, ocean temperature, ice sheet volume changes, and, as we've noted, the inputs from the sun and the thermal response of the Earth. Enhance precipitation and drought forecasts to improve water quality management and water resource management. And improve land use, agriculture, and ocean productivity forecasts for better uh, planning harvest cycles. And finally, more reliable air quality forecasts to enable effective urban pollution management and to protect the elderly and other populations at risk. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any further questions. Governor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> members of the committee, ranking member Hall. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I'm Jim Geringer, as you've introduced me. I'm with the Environmental Systems Research Institute, a leader in uh, geospatial information systems. I served as governor of Wyoming. I also represent the Alliance for Earth Observations, which is a group of people who are interested in an observation system of uh, a totally integrated type. It includes academia, nonprofits, non-governmental, as well as in industrial members. 
My past includes time as a ag producer, a farmer. <laughs> I've, I've used Earth observation information for several years and also worked on the unmanned space program, launching, among other things, a global positioning satellite system that we knew as Navstar at the time. I deeply appreciate what Drs. Moore and Anthes have put together through their committee. I serve on the Mapping Science Committee, also under the National Research Council, not associated with their activity, but I very well understand the quality and breadth of reports that uh, this don't just happen. It takes a lot of effort. My role here, I believe, is to speak from the practical point of view, those who have to do something with the information. For all the college degrees that there might be, the bachelor's, the master's, and the PhD's, I think mine is more relevant as the BT, the been there degree. As a former governor, ag producer, uh, <laughs> my staff used to say it doesn't take a rocket scientist to be governor, but it helps. Uh, one example I would give is what Congressman Hall already brought up, the National Integrated Drought Information System. My part of the Rocky Mountain West is still suffering from a significant drought. I know that we would certainly like to balance out what New York is getting right now. Drought can last longer and extend across larger areas than hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, earthquakes. It causes hundreds of millions of dollars in losses, and it certainly dashes our hopes and dreams. And when the 19 Western governors got together and said we would like to support the use of satellite and other observation information to lessen drought's impact on our region, we requested the NIDUS system, as it is called, because rather than spending billions of dollars, federal dollars in particular, on drought assistance after the fact, we would rather spend more on avoidance before the fact. The strongest case for NIDUS, and in extending on to the, the broader Earth observation activities, it's to enable risk management by individuals to make better uh, judgment and policy decisions by business, by government, and shifting from our practice of reaction and restitution to one of prediction and mitigation. The decadal survey goes far beyond just climate change. It highlights many other earth science areas of practical benefit. Looking at what's happening with increased populations located in high risk zones, such as earthquake faults or near Seacoast, the shortage of clean and accessible fresh water. The shortage of water as a commodity will be the dominant issue from here forward. Human health and security, degradation of uh, both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, soil erosion, invasive species, and certainly uh, our opportunity to do disaster, better disaster management. So all of those are even beyond the climate change issues that have already been raised. There's also a concern that I would bring to you that the lack of access to and the relevance of remotely sensed data frustrates a lot of users. We need to devote more time asking the users what they need and help them find it. Many times it's available, they just don't know it's there. We need a streamlined process for accessing remotely sensed data by the public, policymakers, educational communities, as well as industry. In terms of three broad areas of recommendation I would bring to you based on the decadal survey, Number one, enable the best possible personal and policy decisions, the best information for all kinds of people, providing our citizens with information, technology, and tools to monitor and respond in their own way to our changing world, protecting their lives, livelihood, and property. Number two, provide an integrated Earth observation system, otherwise known as IEOS, to assure the U.S. competitiveness. Our American competitiveness is slipping without the uh, projects and the missions described by the two co-chairmen here. Number three, designate clear leadership responsibilities to resolve the issues and attain the goals identified in the decadal study. Our United States private sector capabilities lead all other nations today with uh, activities such as Google Earth, Microsoft, Yahoo, our own product at ESRI, providing online mapping sites using remotely sensed imagery that the public now takes for granted. Other private sector companies such as GOI and Digital Globe, well known uh, in Colorado, provide high resolution imagery for tourism, real estate, insurance companies to use. It has enabled corrections to legal descriptions, settled land ownership disputes, light detection, light detection and ranging or LIDAR sensors are used to map terrain and to define flood, floodplain mapping and allow state and local governments to aid in their own development decisions. There are so many sources that are brought to bear in addition to satellite imagery to mitigate and respond to uh, catastrophic events. Now, I was also asked to specifically address how Earth observations are used in the agricultural sector, but first let me address how they are not. 
current Earth observations are highly fragmented with different systems that were set at different times by different organizations, by different Congresses for different reasons, and few, if any, of them are cross-correlated, especially within the federal space. NOAA has their weather observations, the FAA has surface observations, the USGS has stream gauging, and the Department of Agriculture through the NRCS employs snowpack telemetry. We do not have a coherent integrated system to deliver each of the products so that we can tell their relationships and their interrelationships. Satellite remote sensing indeed though is broadly used in sustainable agriculture, forestry, responsible nat natural resource stewardship, both in the public and the private domain, monitoring foreign and domestic yearly yields on harvest of food and fiber to predict where the balances and the imbalances might occur, measuring soil erosion from wind and water, evaluating the impact of climate change, detecting the presence of invasive species, plants, animals, insects, and diseases that affect the wide range of agriculture, detecting and measuring contamination of soil, water, and air resources, looking at landscape health, measuring resources involved with the development of biofuels, and certainly with the shift from food production to biofuels, being able to monitor that. So remotely sensed observations support the entire agriculture value stream from monitoring, detecting change, identifying solutions, taking action, and then finding out in return what the result of those actions were. There are many uses of agriculture, in, uh, such as hyperspectral imagery. Uh, it's by individual farmers and ranchers all the way up to what you're doing on this committee, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Whatever the user is, they want objective, timely, and accurate information. And timeliness is by far the, the most important because the value of information is the highest when uncertainty is the highest. And it's certainly, uh, uncertainty is certainly common in agriculture. One of the statements in the uh, report says that satellites, and I quote, satellite observations have spatial and temporal resolution limitations and hence alone do not provide a picture of Earth system that's sufficient for understanding all of the key physical, chemical, and biological processes, end quote. What we need is a system of space, ground, airborne, and ocean-based sensors, both public and private, that can gather complementary information and can be integrated with a minimum of duplication. In addition, we need a national network of web-based information integration of how our collective efforts, and I had proposed in the uh, appendix attached to my written remarks how we could integrate that through a geospatial able, enabled information system. So to sum up, we can build on the decadal study results by ensuring that the U.S. has long-term Earth observation capability and that it's maintained. Certainly what we heard this morning is we're not even maintaining addressing the void in leadership and, and uh, how the vision could pull it all together, addressing a single point of contact or program office within the Office of Science and Technology Policy, improving our research to operations efforts across all agencies, establishing a common integrated information infrastructure readily available through web portal, portals to the public and policymakers alike, Implement the U.S. Integrated Earth Observation System, IEOS, which is part of the Global Earth Observation System of Systems, or GEOS. And then begin a dialogue with the private sector, industry, academia, non-governmental organizations to assure that all observation assets respond to the needs of all of our various sectors, as well as to consider new technology solutions. A high-level commission that includes the private sector, non-governmental, and governmental representatives particularly state and local, could further examine and develop an integrated plan for Earth observations. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Governor, and uh, those were for good recommendations that we certainly want to put in the mix. Thank you for that real-world uh, suggestion. Uh, Dr. Moore, as you showed us this, uh, the budget, it demonstrates that really these systems have been hit with a double whammy. One is the reduction in, in funding, and secondly, just the ineptitude at NEPOs. Um, uh, it is, you know, the waste of money there is, is so disheartening. Um, it, this, that is a major priority for this committee. Under Chairman Bowler, he did his best to, to uh, try to get a handle on that, and uh, I don't think that we got good information. He, I think he would concur with that. I have talked both with the um, Secretary of Commerce as well as the President and CEO of Boeing. They tell me they are on top of this now, and it's going to be a priority. So I hope we're going to see it brought back into line. But let me, what I'd like to ask you about, 
is you mentioned there were 17 replacement missions. Um, although none of those are in the budget for 2008, and um, it's if history is any lesson to us, it it is um, certainly I think we can we can assume that all 17 won't be in the future, and and very possibly none. So can you tell me? Can you break that down in terms of? what we're going to lose in terms of just status quo if we don't have these 17 missions versus what we're going to lose in terms of keeping up with the state of the art. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Congressman Gordon, let me first agree with you that uh, uh, circumstances we face today are the result of a perfect storm. Uh, the decline in the NASA budget and then the failure on the end posts uh, leave us in a very uh, precarious position. What are we not going to have? We recommended earlier in our, uh, early in the study uh, for the early phase, an ISAT follow-on. The ISAT mission failed. There were difficulties. Uh, uh, and yet we know that ICE measurements uh, are one of the critical measurements as we look at the question of climate change. Uh, the Earth radiation budget, this is fundamental to any climate modeling. Uh, uh, that was descoped off of uh, uh, the NPOS system, and so now we're vulnerable. Uh, I think the um, the issue of carbon sources and, and sinks. Uh, there is a mission that is being developed, uh, the orbiting carbon observatory, uh, but it is sunlight dependent, and uh, it must operate in a very clear sky. Uh, when well, you don't study the carbon cycle and sources and sinks because of photosynthesis. Uh, uh, adequately with a sunlight-dependent mission. Uh, so we have to have a follow-on that uh, uses lasers. That's not in the budget. Uh, the issue of hyperspectral, for instance, in determining disease outbreaks. This is something we've tried to achieve for a number of years. That's not in the budget. Uh, air pollution model, uh, monitoring, that's not in the budget. Uh, and I want to go back to one thing that we mentioned earlier. All we have to do is to get back to where we were. And so as a percent of GDP, as a percent of the NASA budget, as a percent of household income, that would be lower uh, in the future than it was in the year 2000, in the year 1996. At that time, this country thought that these measurements were important. And we've just gone down this slide. And I think that uh, the extraordinary thing is we could achieve this robust program if we could just simply get the budget restored back to where it was in the year 2000. Thank you. Governor, do you endorse this proposal? Chairman, yes. There are uh, several features of this proposal, in particular the, uh, the ones that call for innovation and creative approaches and a, a formal planning and, and a program office, uh, such as through the OSTP, to pull everything together to consolidate a vision and a uh, in a, in a practical way, put a process together to where it can be administered to phase it and make it work. And Governor, as a Republican Western Governor, who, as you say, is, has seen this up firsthand, um, could you again tell us what you think? If, if you know, we've all seen the ad about "Pay me now or pay me later." Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, of money, public and private dollars, in terms of, of suffering of folks, just at least in Wyoming in the West, what is your uh, opinion of what kind of price are we going to pay if we don't do this? Well, the price you pay is uh, it's tough to quantify, but in terms of just what we enable other people to do, I guess my, my focus would be on not the dollars that are spent, but the frustration of individuals who know what they could do if they had the tools and the information to make decisions, to manage the risk, to make and their own business work. You know, we have five children, ten grandchildren. They're all interested in what they might do. And instead of expecting a job, we would like them to go out and make a job. Well, how do you make a job if you don't have the information required to plan your industry, to manage the risk, and to understand the marketplace? And the marketplace is driven by a lot of external information, particularly derived from satellites such as this. So it's, the cost is, is beyond dollar amounts. It's, it's just in... Uh, our ability to enable the next generation. <laughs> Governor, 
the decadal survey, as you know, recommends an increase of 500 million per year in NASA's Earth Science budget to implement the uh, survey's recommendations. But we're told, and what we hear, and what we read, and what seems to be uh, every almost everyone's understanding is that we're not likely to see that large an increase in NASA's budget any time in the near future. Given the limited funding situation, which of the missions recommended by the Decadal Survey do you believe are the most important for the federal government to implement? Chairman, uh, Congressman Hall, the, I don't know that I would pick out any one, but I would pick out an approach, I guess is the best way to put it. The, uh, the recommendation, and this is not a mission in particular, but it's a recommendation where, the, where OSTP pulls together everything, I think, is one of the, the lowest cost and probably a very significant cost avoidance recommendation so we can put together a plan to achieve and sustain. I think the first concentration needs to be on to sustain what we expect to be out there. Look at the uh, predictive capabilities for today's storm here in D.C. Uh, if we lose that capability, I can't imagine what would go on outside your doorstep here. Uh, the other things, and Dr. Antes and I were talking earlier about GPS systems, the global positioning satellites that are up there that can be used with uh, suborbital sensors to de detect changes in the atmosphere, major density. It's a relatively low cost mission uh, that could be accomplished with existing satellites complemented with a, a marginal increase in funding. I particularly like one of the recommendations that says that the, uh, the three agencies, principal agencies, NASA, NOAA, and USGS, should pursue innovative approaches. I think we need to cut them loose and let them pursue some innovative approaches. That's one of the things that has always benefited our economy and our competitiveness. Let's not be so rigid. Let's give them the tools, the ability, and the funding to make it work in creative ways. I'll ask one other question of Dr. Uh, of Dr. Antes. You made a statement that I agree with. You said, we want to get back to where we were. And we're in the second month of that uh, this year of wanting to get back to where we were prior to, to the November election. <laughs> so I'm going to, I think, I think you've, you made a good statement. You must be a Republican. <laughs> Let, ser seriously, let me ask you this. Uh, <laughs> explain to us with some kind of concrete example uh, how the missions recommended in the decadal survey is going to improve weather forecast. And uh, are we talking about more accurate pr uh, predictions, <clears throat> longer range predictions, uh, or some other type of improvement? Uh, thank you very to much. Get back uh, where Dr. Moore says we ought to be. Congressman Hall, I was um, referring to the nonpartisan state of uh, Earth observations. Okay. <laughs> I just send it for the record. Uh, I appreciate that question. I, I think this gives me an opportunity to talk about what we need is a system of observations. It's not, we don't have a silver bullet out there to improve weather forecasting. It's very much like the, when you go to the doctor for a checkup, you don't just ask, he doesn't just ask you or she asks you how, how much you weigh or how tall you are or what your blood pressure is or what your cholesterol level is or how fast you can do a treadmill or what your heart condition is or your lung condition is. Uh, you need to know all of these things about the body. So you need many different kinds of observations. If number one, you're going to understand the health of the, the body, and number two, if you're going to make any kind of projections about what your prognosis is for the future. So weather forecasting is kind of like that. We don't need just temperatures in the atmosphere or just ocean temperatures or just winds or just cloud cover. We need it all because they all contribute independent information. So what we're suggesting is this balanced set of recommendations, which includes winds, temperature, water vapor, ocean temperature, uh, these are going to improve all aspects of weather forecasting from the two-week forecast. By the way, I did a hearing at the Senate just, just a week ago. I got back to the hotel, I looked at the long-range forecast, and I said to my colleagues here, Tuesday is going to be a big storm event in the east. Watch out. That's uh, seven days in advance. That's not bad. We stand to lose that that capability if, if the present uh, trends toward observations, lo losses of observations continue. On the positive side, we're not anywhere near the limit in predictability, what we could do. 
Look at Katrina. Uh, Katrina, wonderful forecast, but that was unusually good. We need to get every hurricane forecast hitting, heading for the Gulf Coast, uh, the East Coast, uh, at that accuracy. So uh, it's not just a negative thing about forecasts getting worse if we don't get uh, more, uh, if, we, if we lose observations. If there's a positive benefit here of getting a balanced set of observations and improving our forecast of tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, extending the warnings of severe events, uh, and, and right into the uh, interseasonal variability of, of climates, uh, including the droughts that uh, the Governor uh, talked about. How long would it yes. take? Excuse me, my time up. It has to throw. You go right ahead if you need uh, I just want to ask, follow up, uh, uh, how long would it take the average citizen uh, with all those uh, uh, types of uh, tests uh, that, that all of us can understand, any of them individually, but not all of them together? How long would it take until the, uh, the average citizen would see these improvements in daily operational weather forecast? And if accuracy is your main thrust, uh, what about uh, uh, the long range, the timeliness of it? Well, uh, forecast improvements have been gradual, and, and they will continue to be gradual. So the, uh, uh, but what happens is the human's expectation grows as the accuracy gets better. So what we take for granted now is a, three, is a good three-day forecast. We're now expecting that at six days or seven days. And so the expectations rise as the accuracy rises. However, people who really look at this and depend on it for an economic living know they keep track of the score as accuracy increases and so because they're making decisions based on probabilities. And so the people who really need it to make quantitative decisions are, are doing this right now. For you and me, uh, the public, it'll be so gradual that you know you'll wake up ten years from now and we'll, and we'll have good two-week forecasts instead of good week forecasts. So it's gradual for the public. It's very valuable and, and well monitored for the decision maker. I thank all three of you. Yield back. Your time has expired, Mr. Udall. Recognized for five minutes. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want I want Judge Hall to know that we always take him seriously. Um, I did also in the. Uh, the decadal survey recommendations note that there were over 100 proposed missions, and you all distilled it down to 17, with the idea that they're they're integrated, uh, and uh, I'm sure there were some tough trade-offs there, but I think it's important that the committee understand that and the general public that this is not just a wish list. This is a very focused uh, effort to identify where we have the maximum return on our investment. If I could, in that spirit, I wanted to. Uh, talk about the opportunity cost, explore that if we uh, do not maintain a robust earth observing system. And as I understand it, we need continuity in earth observing data over long time periods to improve uh, smaller scale regional climate projection models. And it seems to me that uh, we're going to need better regional information that would allow us to be better prepared for changes in climate that are likely to occur even if we stabilize greenhouse gas emissions. And then also if we, and I shouldn't say if, I, I want to say when we adopt measures to limit greenhouse gases, we'll need to verify that the measures we adopt are in fact resulting in reduced emissions and lower concentrations of greenhouse gases. So what role would the Earth observing system you're proposing play in fulfilling those needs? And is it going to be more difficult to, or take longer to accomplish these two things without an Earth observing system? And we start Dr. Anthes and then Dr. Moore, you could follow on. Well, that's a very uh, excellent question. And the, uh, the, the programs that we are uh, proposing, first of all, it's really good. No, you noted that we went from over 100 proposed missions to 17. And one of the criteria we had for prioritization was that it had to be affordable. Second point is it's mm -hmm. a balance program. Uh, it supports climate as well as weather. It supports uh, uh, industry, agriculture, water management, as well as uh, as well as science, and so the uh, the program we are proposing is an integrated set of observations, and we think we need them all uh, for exactly the reasons that you uh, you uh, iterated. Dr. Moore, let me just draw attention to uh, uh, three points. <clears throat> First of all. Uh, as you know, uh, stabilization of uh, greenhouse gas emissions is going to be a, a very real challenge, but a challenge we must meet. Uh, stabilization of emissions does not lead to a stable concentration in the atmosphere. Stabilization of emissions is a step towards stabilizing the concentration in the atmosphere. But stable emissions 
will only lead to a constant growth of CO2, for instance, in the atmosphere. So that means that we have to face this question of climate change head on. Uh, one of the missions that we recommend for the early time phase focuses on soil moisture. Soil moisture is perhaps one of the key ingredients in climate models, as well as in terms of what's really important to, to people who live uh, based uh, in areas based upon agriculture. But also means if you live in an area uh, that is a floodplain. So I think that's a key issue. And the third is that uh, the kind of uh, missions that we recommended, for instance, on CO2, uh, where we look for sources and sinks of carbon dioxide, uh, any kind of management system of greenhouse gases is going to require the knowledge of what are the sources and sinks for carbon dioxide. It's fundamental. Chairman Gordon, I know the clock isn't running. I'm assuming I've got a minute or two uh, left. Um, or I should say the lights aren't working. Uh, chapter 2 uh, in the report lists six emerging regional global challenges. Uh, to mention uh, two of them, changes in natural systems due to climate change and the role of ice sheets in, in the sea level rise, and there are four other uh, identified uh, challenges. Can we address those challenges if we do, don't maintain an Earth-observing system? And maybe you could provide an example or two of, that would illustrate how our ability to uh, respond to these challenges will be limited by the lack of information uh, from Earth-observing systems if we don't have those up uh, in place. Well, there's we could we could all probably come up with with many examples. Let me just give give one. Uh, sea level rise is one of the most important uh, uh, issues uh, facing uh, society, particularly in in uh, the next generation, the generation after that. Uh, for many years, the models of glaciers uh, indicated a relatively slow melt of the uh, Greenland ice cap, but just in the last uh, few uh, uh, months, years. Uh, through measurements, very precise measurements of the Earth's gravity field, uh, we could tell that the uh, Greenland was losing mass at a far faster rate than the models of ice melt would indicate. And what ap apparently is happening, and I'm not a glaciologist, so uh, bear with me, but apparently it's the uh, uh, water is running down and uh, causing a slippage of the ice uh, off the continent. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, a much faster rate of ice melt than uh, we were uh, predicting uh, a few, a few, uh, even a few years ago. So if we suddenly stop measuring the Earth's gravity or suddenly stop measuring how fast the ice is melting, we don't know whether that's an anomaly, uh, you know, that happened to be a, an anomaly over the last couple of years, a, a rapid ice melt, and it's going to go back to a slow melt, or it's going to continue to accelerate. And so what we might be thinking is a 100-year problem might suddenly become a 25-year problem. Uh, we don't know. But these are the kinds of uh, questions and, and, uh, that we really need to, uh, to, to stay on top of because we're going to have surprises. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Bartlett is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. As you probably have uh, noted in the papers, our uh, zeal for producing ethanol has driven the price of corn from $2.11 a bushel in September to $4.08 a bushel in December. Uh, this is very likely, I think, to uh, encourage farmers to take lands out of agricultural reserve, most of which lands shouldn't really be farmed, which is why they're in there. But $4 a bushel corn is going to be a big incentive to take those lands out of uh, agriculture reserve and uh, put them into production. There are other reasons for uh, being concerned about the, uh, the use of fossil fuels. But if we limit ourselves just to the environmental uh, effects, uh, clearly uh, we need to understand the environmental effects of, uh, of, of CO2, and we do. But there are also going to be big environmental effects of taking these lands out of agriculture reserve and putting them into production. My question is, uh, how much will uh, our decision makers lose in uh, quality data for making decisions as to how we need to move in the future relative to, uh, to this ethanol thing if we don't have the additional programs that you all are encouraging? Uh, 
This is an area where I, I want to compliment NASA. Uh, it does appear that the uh, increase in 08 and 09, uh, which is an increase off a downward trend, uh, is to essentially address, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, the precipitation mi uh, mission and the Landsat. Uh, the Landsat satellite system will be fundamental for monitoring agricultural regions. Uh, absolutely fundamental. You need the high resolution if you're to determine what type of crop is growing. And so this whole issue of biofuels uh, will uh, be very dependent upon the Landsat system. So that I think that NASA is doing a good job getting it back on track. Our public policy people are going to be uh, caught on the horns of a uh, dilemma. Uh, clearly, uh, greenhouse gases are implicated in the uh, uh, increased Earth's temperature. And that's a big environmental concern. But all of uh, life on Earth is dependent on about the upper uh, eight inches of topsoil. If you can't grow food, you're not here. And as we take this uh, land out of reserve and put it in production, we're going to be losing more topsoil. And so our policymakers are going to be faced with a uh, tough decision. Uh, do we uh, uh, save our topsoil by increasing CO2, which is the uh, greater of those two uh, uh, evils? And my concern is that uh, uh, we will need more, not less, uh, information for making those decisions. And I would just like to get on the record uh, my concern, and the concerns of a great many people, that uh, there are two environmental uh, concerns here that are kind of intention. And, uh, you know, which way are we going to go? And I think that will be largely dependent on the quality of the information we get. And so in very real sense, um, this is more than just a, an academic uh, uh, exercise. It will affect uh, each uh, uh, one of us, not only by the quality of the air we breathe, but uh, potentially by the uh, volume of crops that we're able to uh, to grow. Mr. Chairman, let me uh, think it was more of a statement than a question, but let me respond anyway. Uh, you asked what would happen. One of the things that agriculture uses, one thing a governor uses, is as much information as they can. Having been in politics for a number of years, I'm struck by how, in the absence of information, we make decisions anyway. Uh, anecdotes serve us well, don't they? It's easier to make a, a judgment based on an anecdote from a story back home, absent any other information. So now let me turn it around and say, if we had better information, such as what Landsat 5 and Landsat 7 started, but are not going to continue, and certainly the granularity and the detail that we need today just to make individual decisions in agricultural production for individuals, and then to take that beyond and say what has been the impact of increasing <coughs> ethanol or other renewable fuel production as an offset to, say, food supply, or the loss and erosion of topsoil, what are the practices that, that happen, how do we know that they're happening other than anecdote if we don't have a broader view that only satellite imagery can provide as well as ground-based information. So you need a combination. and we, We're not going to be able to even evaluate the shift of production from food to fuel if we, if we don't have the sensors in place. Thank you, Dr. Governor, and thank you, uh, Dr. Bartlett. Mr. Chairman, I know my time is up, but I'd like unanimous consent to submit a question for the record. Certainly. Thank Absolutely. you, sir. Dr. Wu. Thank you very much. And my mom always wished I'd finished medical school, and, and I've been upgraded. And I'm going to tell her about this. But thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, first, just a um, dropout is such a harsh word. Uh, I, I am on I, I am on a leave of absence from my medical school, uh, which has now gone on for approximately. Well, we're approaching the f end of the third decade. Of course, that was after getting a law degree, too. So, and and I'm told, I'm sure that if I just had admitted my dire mistake, they'd let me back in because the admissions committee there never makes mistakes. Um, but first, just a question of curiosity, if you gentlemen, if a meteorologist friend of mine said years ago that 
uh, at five days, the forecast is random. You might as well just you know, throw it against the wall. But that was a few years ago. At what point does your forecast or any meteorologist's forecast just kind of go random these days? And, and I, I'm just kind of curious. Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, years ago, there was some theory done on uh, nonlinear systems which said that there was a predictability limit of about two weeks. That was a theoretical limit. That's it. After two weeks, things became random. Uh, we may be a little longer than that, but that's still the order. We, we don't see uh, what we call the typical weather forecast being accurate ever beyond more than a couple of weeks. Right now, we have pretty good skill out to seven to ten days. Seven to ten days. Okay. Yeah, my BlackBerry gives me six days, so it's within that margin, huh? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, more serious question. Uh, the chairman referred earlier to the NPOS program, and my understanding is uh, that uh, uh, because of uh, cost issues, cost overruns, that various instruments have been sort of thrown off the bus, and uh, they, they tend to be the climate instruments. And, and Dr. Moore, you mentioned earlier that soil, mo soil moisture is a very, very important uh, factor to track for climate change purposes. And it also is the case that our military is very interested in soil mo moisture for, for other reasons. Uh, so uh, I assume climatologists have a very strong interest in soil mo moisture for one set of reasons, and the U.S. Armed Forces have the same uh, interest. Uh, now, uh, I think a list is coming of the various int instruments which were tossed off the NPOs for budgetary reasons. And I, I just want, I'm just asking you all if you are familiar enough with it, if you could identify uh, the order in which you would bring the, in the cast off instruments back. If you're not familiar with the hardware uh, in enough, at least the, the, the data streams that you would like to see. Ah, the cavalry coming. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, the data that you would like like to see uh, from NPOS. Yes, Congressman Wu. Uh, in the Decato, we uh, uh, prioritize uh, uh, under a very limited basis. Uh, we recognize uh, the budgetary uh, difficulties, and uh, the first was the Earth radiation budget instruments. That is the measure of the solar. Uh, radiance and the and the uh, reflected energy off the planet. The second was the uh, profile of ozone in the atmosphere because we are in this period of regulating the fluorocarbons and we're going to see hopefully the restoration of the ozone hole. But ma monitoring that profile, the different concentrations and altitude, was the second priority. Uh, that be aerosols. <clears throat> uh, no, that. Uh, Certainly is a priority, but now we're we uh, essentially felt that uh, given the constraints of the budget on NPOs, that was about as far as we would recommend in terms of restoration. Is that all we need to do? Absolutely not. I, I'm um, sorry, I'm just trying to look on my list here, and and I'm <coughs> not finding a, finding an, uh, an ozone meter per se. But uh, which yes, instrument would the, that be? In? Uh, it's called uh, ozone mon uh, the OMPS instrument. It's the limb sounding aspect that was lost. The um, ah, on slim. Right. Okay. That was lost. So that we're recommending put back on and the series and the solar radiance monitor we're recommending uh, to put back on. With regards to the soil moisture, that was to be measured by an instrument called CMIS. C-M-I-S. This is a follow-on to what is on the uh, defense meteorological satellites right now. Uh, Given the fact that that was being uh, uh, descoped, uh, we uh, called for the preservation of sea surface temperatures and winds. And then we offset the loss of the soil moisture by recommending a NASA mission for soil moisture. And uh, I must say that, that, that there are a lot of very important uh, measurements. For instance, sea surface altimetry that Dr. Anthony spoke about, the sea level height. That instrument is gone. Uh, we're trying to compensate for that by recommending an altimeter to NASA. Uh, it is true that most of the climate measurements were lost on NPOS. 
And I think that perhaps the best strategy is the uh, program we're, we're recommending to NASA. If you're pushing over in NASA, is that realistic given the budget crunch over on that side of the house, if you will? No, I, 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 under, I understand this budget issue and the budget crunch. But the, but the fact remi remains is that the, the observational needs exist. And the budget was reduced over six years by a third. That seems to have been in error. The and therefore, we need to restore that budget so that we could meet the observational needs of the planet. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Robacher is uh, has five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate you on uh, your report and uh, the hard work that went into this. And uh, discipline necessary to actually come up with something uh, that does not totally depend on uh, what I consider to be a, a trendy uh, issue of the day, which is climate change overall. You've made your arguments that included climate change as a, as a reason, but you've well outlined your, uh, you know, your you're basically the benefits that will derive even if even if we don't have a global warming scenario uh... you've outlined the need for the type of observation that uh... you're advocating and uh... let me also note it, it's unfortunate that uh, we lost uh, i guess it was a three billion dollar overrun for end posts i mean that's what we're talking about with three billion dollars let me note mr chairman what could we do with three billion dollars? We could implement everything that's being said today. The request basically today is let's make up for the failure of impose. That's basically what we're saying because that's a six year, well, they're asking for five hundred million dollars a year, it would put us back on schedule, and we lost three billion dollars in just the overrun cost. Let me add there are some questions as to the reason why impose failed, and some of the reasons, and I know people aren't going to want to hear this, but some of the reasons are additions to NPOs, things that were added on to NPOs that were designed to prove climate change, which helped the failure of NPOs. So there is a cost when people go after things that uh, may be uh, trying to stampede the public into spending more money for climate change, that ends up a dramatic cost to other aspects of what we'd like to achieve. I uh, was especially uh, uh, interested in the fact that this does measure sun and solar activities, which I believe are the basis for a lot of the, rather than human activity and carbon being put into the air, or hydrocarbons <coughs> being put into the air and greenhouse gases, um, <coughs> may well explain uh, why we have certain changes in in uh, uh, in climate and in temperature on the on the Earth? Uh, let me ask uh, this about uh, you know we again you you've given me a lot of information and by the way I just say again I thank you for that because uh, I was listening intently and I think you all made your point and Governor uh, uh, I'm glad you were here to make a uh, uh, to really tell us what, how we, this is going to be uh, cost-effective uh, for humankind to know this, because it is. I mean, we're talking, we're not, you're not talking about contributing just knowledge. You're talking about contributing something that's going to change people's way of life for the better. And again, I think you've made your arguments today. Um, the, um, I guess I mean, I'm just taking notes while you're, you're went through here. I, uh, let me ask you, Dr. Athies, is that how you pronounce it? Anthes. Anthes. Um, are there more cyclones and, and hurricanes today than there used to be? Uh, that's a very good question, and it's a hot topic of debate. I'll put it that way. That's why uh, I ask it. We don't. Uh, we don't. Uh, I actually started out as a tropical cyclone uh, research meteorologist. And I must say, because of the uh, observational record being particularly bad uh, before uh, the advent of satellites in the 70s, we have uh, maybe 70 years, 80 years, 90 years of an incomplete uh, and imperfect satellite data record on, on tropical storms. So 
so frankly, uh, you know, you'll read papers on both sides of this. Okay. This point. Frankly, uh, I don't know. I haven't made up my mind yet. All right. Uh, and that's one reason for uh, having these ob observations from space, so that we know whether trends of of, uh, of intensity is increasing or not. Because uh, I, I don't think the evidence is conclusive yet. Yeah, I uh, um, I will have to say I sat through hurricanes when I was younger, when I lived in North Carolina, when I was in like sixth, seventh grade, and. Uh, uh, I read about the great hurricanes that came through Florida and Galveston, Texas, and we know that there were huge tropical storms then. Uh, one question for the governor, and then I guess I, my time may be up. Uh, why is it? Would be, why do you see it being necessary to have a satellite system that gives an overall view of, for example, agricultural production? Don't we have enough uh, uh, computerization and records being kept? Uh, uh, throughout the states and by the federal government based on just the number of farmers and the, the type of uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, efforts that we make, don't we? Isn't that accurate enough to see how many acres of corn we're growing? Mr. Chairman, Congressman Rohrabacher, the, uh, we do accumulate a lot of information and one of the points I made is that we don't know how to discover and serve that information in a useful way, so that's part of the answer. The other part of it is we don't know the extent, and I'll give you a different example. It's not even in our country. There's a uh, consortium of uh, countries that have put together a satellite constellation called the Disaster Monitoring Constellation. That's the United Kingdom, Algeria, China, Nigeria, I Algeria, and Nigeria, and Turkey. Now, they launched these constellation of low-cost satellites to monitor for disaster prediction and mitigation. But what they've done is they've started monitoring opium production in Afghanistan. Now, they don't have quite the uh, ah, okay. statistical reporting system that we have in the United States on opium production, <laughs> but uh, they have shown that in the, the, the one year from 2005 to 2006 that the uh, opium cultivation grew by about 60% in Afghanistan. That affects us. It doesn't affect agriculture. It affects everybody. Now. How do we truth up what is reported on the ground through statistical reporting services, the soil condition, the erosion, you know, the loss of forests and things like that? How do we truth that up with what's reported on the ground with what the satellites look at? The MODIS satellite is one of the key satellites that we use for that kind of information in addition to Landsat. So there's, it's, the, it's the ability to know what you have, the quality of the data, how to use the data, and then how do you integrate it to where you can make a uh, an overall decision, a system, systematic decision, not just a, 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 a knee-jerk type well, one. Thank you very much, and again, I think you've made your case, and uh, I appreciate the good suggestions, by the way, as well, not just making the case for the expenditure, <clears throat> but suggestions on how we can manage the system and do a better job for, and be more effective for what we do spend. So thank you very much. It was time to expire, and I will say that, Mr. Robacher, you're your line of questions always makes for a better hearing, uh, and we thank you for it. But I will point out one thing, that the knobs on the global warming uh, instruments go both ways. So it's not just to prove it, it could be also to disprove it. <laughs> um, uh, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the witnesses for being here. It's been interesting. I guess I have a, a question that... Um, might be considered kind of dumb, but when we have interruptions uh, of observation, well, no matter what causes it, uh, is it thought that we miss something in the meantime, or uh, does it interfere with how we work to certain points? Um. Well, it's, it's not a dumb question. Um, explaining why gaps in the data record are important is, 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 is not that easy. But let me, let me try. Uh, if, you, if you're looking at a, uh, say, a 20-year a cycle, and uh, you miss seven years of that cycle, you're not going to be able to tell what that cycle really is if you're missing seven years out of 20. So, so, so that's one reason. Another reason is, uh, a gap at the end of a record, in other words, stopping a measurement, is the worst gap of all because you don't know whether the last little uptick or the last little downturn is continuing for the, you know, into the future or not. You look at any record and you'll see this kind of thing. If you stop at this point when you're going down 
and, and a gap starts, you don't know whether that turns around and starts coming up again or continues to go down. So gaps are a very important uh, problem in terms of uh, understanding cycles and uh, trends uh, of whatever it is, sea level, temperature, water vapor, precipitation, drought, frequency, whatever. So when you have um, great reductions in the budget and, and perhaps uh, gaps, is it is it worth the investment to um, start and stop, start and stop, or and do we get any real useful information, or are we wasting money if we don't do it any better? I think one of the challenges, uh, and I believe the governor noted this also, is the question of sustainability of the observational system. And that actually carries with it some uh, real requirements. Instruments don't last forever, and that's why we have gaps. One of the problems is that if you're measuring something like temperature and it's increasing slowly, and that instrument fails, and then we put another temperature instrument on orbit. Mm -hmm. If we don't overlap uh, those two instruments, uh, how are we then to interpret what the new instrument says? For instance, maybe the new instrument shows temperature increasing even more rapidly. Is that because it's a new instrument, or is that because of what temperature is doing? So the issue of sustainability is, a, is right at the core of what we are addressing. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, there is no question in my mind about climate change. If you live and breathe every day, you can observe it. What, what, where my questions still are is if we don't find much of the reason and start to correct that, where do we go from here? Um, I went over and looked at the results of the tsunami. And as we return, uh, the, the latest rumor was that it might happen in California, and so there was an urgency to see if they couldn't get the um, um, ob observation um, network in place. What comes next? I mean, we, we can observe and we can predict, and I know that we've lost, we have saved a lot of um, lives by predicting but we haven't done very well with property. Um, I'm fully aware that if we had worked on levees when we were supposed to back in New Orleans, it probably would not have been as bad. But predictably, would it have come? And, and um, because according to the simulations that we had observed, it was coming. And I don't know whether we concentrate on making sure that levees are strong or do we concentrate on changing something in the environment where we can avoid um, some of the destruction if we, um, if, we, if we had an idea of what we needed to do. Maybe I can answer it in a little different way. I was visiting with the executive of King County, Washington about a week ago. And he's, he's taking an approach that if something does happen based on climate change and causes the sea level to rise, what could, what could be causing that? It could be the uh, greenhouse gases. So they're taking a, an approach from two different angles. One is to reduce the amount of carbon that they use in King County, which includes a uh, significant part of Seattle, Redmond, you know, those, where some of those companies are that we hear about. Reduce the amount of carbon. At the same time, based on the prediction of sea level rise by 2050, raise their levees to where there will be no flooding. And then with the carbon that they have offset, that becomes a revenue raiser for King County. They can sell and trade carbon credits. So they're doing two things. One is they're decreasing the total amount of greenhouse gas, anticipating that there's still going to be a rise in sea level. And over time, of course, and the idea is that it flattens out or at least declines. Uh, so that they're taking an approach like that, where they, uh, from a practical point of view, raise a little revenue, but improve the situation as well. 
Thank you, sir. The gentlelady's Thank time you. has expired. Uh, Mr. Bilber is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I come from uh, an air regulatory uh, background, Air Resources Board in California. And <clears throat> because of sensing and monitoring, we ch totally changed our strategy on air emissions. We had grossly underestimated um, evaporative emissions, and we couldn't figure out what, where all it was coming from until we figured out it wasn't coming out of the tailpipe. Um, my interest here is what you're proposing is giving us the tools to be able to uh, develop and um, execute good policy. Uh, the, um, and Governor, I think you're, you're pointing out the remote sensing gives us the ability to monitor where we may not have records. And a good example is, is that the third world. Um, so many people say the third world is not a major factor here. It's because we don't have any air indexing in the third world. And um, remote sensing may be the only way for us to detect what's going on there. Um, the question I have, uh, Dr. Moore, um, would be one of the new factors that have been thrown out is the concept of global dimming. And some people may agree with it or totally um, uh, ignore it, but I think that we got to remember that when Roger Vell talked about global warming 20 years ago, some people want to ignore him too. Does, our, does the remote sensing that we're proposing here give us ability to at least monitor maybe the effects of global dimming and how particulate, suspended particulates may be affecting uh, or moderating the, 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 the uh, climate change at this time? Yes, it does, Congressman. Um, it directly addresses the question. And you're absolutely correct in noting that the um, question of global dimming uh, is fundamental to climate change. It's also fundamental to public health. Uh, the issue of particulates and uh, aerosols uh, work the climate system both ways, uh, both as a warming and as a cooling. Uh, one of the missions that we recommend, which is called ACE, ACE directly focuses uh, on this on this question of aerosols and and uh, their influence on the climate system. Second, we're also recommending a uh, geostationary air quality uh, mission, uh, which I think would address some of the questions that major urban cities are going to have as to how much of the pollution is local and how much of it is transcontinental. Okay, and that's essential data. I appreciate you bringing that, you know, uh, pointing that out because w one of the problems I've had with federal policies on a lot of these issues was like the oxygen mandate. They thought it was good. Within 24 months, California knew that the federal oxygen mandate was an environmental negative, not a positive. And um, hopefully, I think it's essential, Mr. Chairman, that this issue will affect. The total strategy. I think a lot of people are saying just do something about global warming. Well, we could be doing exactly the wrong thing at the wrong time if we don't get the right facts. And in fact, right now in California, we're moving strategies ahead that assumes that the dirtiest technology should be the first re eliminated, but that may be the worst thing we do. So hopefully you'll be able to give us the information so that we not only are well-intentioned, but we're smart in the way we apply this. And that's what scares me to death is this rush to do anything could end up creating more problems than an informed and appropriate approach to it. And that's essential down this. And, I, and hopefully the data on global dimming can be settled before we settle on a strategy. Uh, Dr. Um, Zantis, what? Anthes. Anthes. Dr. Anthes, um, let me just say I appreciate you talking about uh, the tropical storm issue because uh, like my scientists at Scripps say, it's interesting that last year global warming caused all of the big hurricanes, but this year nobody talked about, well, it must be global um, uh, cooling because we didn't have any. And I appreciate the fact that you keep things on a balanced keel here because it hurts the credibility of scientists when politicians start throwing around your data without having the facts. Um, but I have a question for you. I come from the state of California. Uh, Hurricanes and tropical storms haven't historically been a problem for us because of the cold water. That may change in the future. But you brought up the issue of being able to detect tsunamis, earthquakes, and other related seismic activity that normally isn't in a, um, remote sensing isn't a big deal out except maybe observation. 
how do you pr propose to use remote sensing to predict earthquakes, um, which then result in tsunamis and all the other activity you were talking about? Okay, well, that's a, good, a really good question, and um, uh, I'm not a geologist, so I'll just have to, but uh, the, uh, the one of our missions, which uh, measures very precisely uh, very small displacements of the surface of the Earth, uh, if, if you do a, a time lapse of, of these, I've seen these, if you do a time lapse of these, you can see the Earth breathing. In fact, I can show you valleys in California, which are just... Much like out. the same way we measure um, El Nino by looking at the rise and fall of the ocean. Of the, of the sea surface height. Right. Well, the Earth is actually changing its elevation by, by centimeters over time. And if you see, uh, 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 well, first of all, by measuring these, uh, where the Earth is changing its elevation and, and pulsating, uh, these are active geological areas. And these can help you, uh, uh, as I understand it, uh, increase the probability of saying, well, an earthquake is going to occur here, a volcano is going to occur there, uh, and of course, uh, uh, also then monitor uh, tsunamis when they actually uh, occur because of the uh, change of, uh, of ocean level. Doctor, we're going to have a vote pretty soon, so if you don't mind, we're going to. I think we should move on. You're no, no, I, I just don't know how you're going to measure pulsating in Los Angeles. It always pulsates, so that's just given. Thank <laughs> you very much, <laughs> Doctor McNerney. You recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank uh, the panel, the distinguished panel, for their work in, in this area. I think it's a very important area. Uh, I was intrigued by Dr. Anthem's uh, comments that uh, some of the work, uh, some of the missions will be to uh, to uh, identify the small difference between uh, I, um, radiation to the Earth from the Sun and then uh, radiation from the Earth uh, as a as a consequence of that. And uh, I think that's a very important thing. I noticed uh, last week uh, my distinguished colleague from Southern, from uh, Orange County, asked some very pointed questions about uh, wanting to know how exactly how much of the carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere was created by human activity, and I know that's a very complicated question, and uh, the balance uh, or, or the issue between science and politics is a tricky issue, and it's our responsibility to have. Uh, a sort of a responsible pathway between those, and I think uh, this is exactly one way that we can move forward to answering those kinds of very difficult and detailed questions. Uh, um, so one of the things I want to know is, is there any um, opportunity in private and international partnerships to help us move forward uh, in, this, uh, in these kinds of missions? Uh, Dr. Moore. Uh, I think that uh, there is, and uh, uh, in our chapter three, where we talk about implementing the mission, the missions, uh, the very first thing we uh, uh, explore is leveraging foreign partnerships. And if you're, for instance, looking at something like the the measurement of carbon dioxide that you mentioned, and where is it coming from, and where is it going to, that's an ideal example of what we could do internationally. Uh, the uh, uh, using a synthetic aperture radar to get these slight differences in uh, the elevation of the planet and how those might lead to uh, uh, earthquakes. That's another great example of where we could collaborate internationally. Uh, our European colleagues have made great advances with synthetic aperture radar. And so this would be another, because these are global issues. They are not just issues for, for one area of the planet. Earthquakes occur globally. CO2 occurs globally. How about the uh, private partnership uh, opportunities? I think the private partnership opportunities are extraordinary, particularly when you look at uh, issues of land remote sensing. Uh, uh, hyperspectral imaging, that, that looks at the reflected sunlight uh, in many different wavelengths. This is a marvelous uh, uh, item for uh, forecasting crop diseases. Uh, this is right on the border of what could be co done commercially. I think the governor has really spoken out on this. This is a great opportunity. One other comment I would make is uh, if we don't keep up, if we lose our edge in competitiveness, we lose two things. With international cooperation, such as through the, the uh, Global Earth Observation System of Systems, we develop relationships so we can understand and trust what we're getting back. Otherwise, we could be excluded and the competition then leads the way. 
who who would you rely on to obtain the information we have no capacity to produce so we need that kind of participatory opportunity as well as the leadership to make it happen okay i yield the balance of my time thank you and the gentleman from michigan dr ellers is recognized for five minutes thank you mr chairman first of all dr anthes i'm i'm very pleased to hear your comment about the earth rising and falling several centimeters a day now i know why i feel taller in some days than others <laughs> Also, presumably my weight varies because I'm further from the center, center of the earth. Uh, anyway, more seriously, uh, I can't believe a physicist just made this comment. Uh, I'm very concerned about uh, NPOs, and we, he talked about that in response to some other questions. I'm very worried about the, uh, the removal of some of the climate centers, and clearly we are not going to be not going to have an optimized system. Uh, they're being removed simply because the cost of the project got too great and, and we had to cut somewhere. Uh, you've talked a bit, uh, Dr. Moore, in fact, just mentioned in the last question, uh, international work. What efforts are being made or what do you, efforts do you think should be made to try to get more international cooperation on some of these satellites? I know other nations are putting up <laughs> their own satellites but in a case like this where the entire international community would benefit from the additional climate observations that NPOS could make, uh, do, you th do you believe our nation should aggressively pursue the possibility of getting assistance, cooperation, and money from other nations? And would we be likely to succeed in that effort? Appreciate any comments you have. Well, I'll take a, a quick answer. Absolutely, we should. We should try all of these uh, avenues of, and approaches. Uh, the U.S. historically has been the world's leader in, in uh, observations from space. In fact, the Europeans uh, probably, uh, I could argue, are, are making better use of the observations that we take and we're making uh, them ourselves. And this gets to the governor's comments about uh, it's more than just observations. It's how you use the observations. Uh, international cooperation uh, is a two-edged sword. It can save money and uh, distribute resources more e equitably and uh, cooperation and sharing and all that. But there are uh, uh, other issues that make uh, these, these uh, international programs uh, hard to manage. Uh, if one partner ha runs into funding problems, it, it, it jeopardizes the mission. If, uh, if a country which is friendly now turns unfriendly 10 years from now, uh, you may not be able to get their data. Uh, there are ITAR uh, uh, issues about transferring technology to foreign countries. Uh, so uh, yes, I, I agree we should pursue it aggressively. Uh, probably it's not a substitute for having our own robust program, but we should try to leverage the international uh, partners wherever we can. Other comments? Uh, uh, just to note that that appears to be part of the uh, plan to uh, mitigate the NPOS uh, difficulties, is to rely uh, on the mid-morning orbit on uh, the Europeans. Uh, but I also uh, second what uh, uh, Rick Antes just said, that it is a two-edged uh, sword. Now, to what extent did your, your group uh, in doing the decadal, decadal, decadal study uh, consider these issues? Did you come up with any particular recommendations on international cooperation and how we should proceed with it? Well, we, we said basically what, what you just, just said, that we should uh, uh, try every single opportunity we can and try to reduce, to reduce this overall cost by sinking international partners. And uh, we didn't go any further than that. We didn't say mission number 13 should be an international one, but uh, all of them should be considered. And if, uh, if the international uh, community comes up with one uh, mission that uh, reduces the need for us to do the same thing, we should consider uh, lo lowering that in priority. Do all nations freely share data with each other uh, from no. those climate missions, or is it, is no. it held very closely? Yes. Uh, one, one comment I'd make there, Congressman Ehlers, is uh, if we don't have standardized protocols, data formats, and how we store and access information like that, it, it's not a matter of who's willing to share. It's a matter of whether you physically can't or the technology isn't there to extract or transform to where you can use the data. So the, uh, the minimum we could do is establish standards and protocols, and that's where the, uh, the integrated earth observation system was intended to head with the... Uh, international cooperation. So just having the data in the format where you can use it 
is a simple step. The other problem is getting all the data down and analyzed quickly and properly. That's something I'm also concerned about with NPOS. Uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Ellers. And I think our final um, um, questioner will be our Vice Chair, Mr. Lipinski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we're running short on time. I can make a quick question. I'm not sure it's going to be a well, that'll be a quick answer, but uh, Dr. Anthes and, and Dr. Moore, in the report, uh, it says, at a time of unprecedented need, the nation's Earth observation satellite programs, once the envy of the world, are in disarray. I have a more general question. What impact does this have, you see this having an impact on American competitiveness? Do you think it has a broader uh, impact on uh, on our nation in that, in that manner? Well, that, that, that's a really good question. Uh, as, as the the uh, One of the points we try to make in the Decatur survey is that these observations are useful to society and useful in management of resources, whether it's energy resources, water resources, supporting agriculture. Uh, so it, it, there's an efficiency issue here uh, that we can become as a nation more efficient if we have these uh, better weather forecasts, uh, seasonal outlooks. We know how to buy uh, energy and uh, store it for the for the uh, cold spells coming up. And so uh, I think you can make a very good case that uh, these observations of the environment uh, do uh, affect in a positive way the uh, U.S. economy, uh, making us more efficient. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, thereby imp improving our competitiveness. Colleagues may want to add to that. I think there's another issue also is that the declining budgets uh, for Earth science at NASA uh, send a signal to our, our graduate students and to our undergraduates as to what fields should they go into. And uh, it's very tough to convince a young student that this is the direction that you want to take your life uh, because they say, well, there's no future in that. So I think that there's a, a fundamental issue as to why students may not be going into earth science or mathematics or physics because they look at the trend. They're quantitative. Having, having spent a few years in, in graduate school on my way to a PhD, finally after many years, I understand the uh, you know, what impact it does have uh, on uh, what people are, uh, what students are pursuing. Thank you. Well, let me just say this really was an excellent panel, and, uh, and I thank you very much for this very informative meeting today. I want to particularly thank the uh, co-chairs of the Decadal Survey for not just the day, but for two and a half years of, of hard but important work. This is a, a uh, really a, a product that we, that we need to have to try to move this decision-making process forward. And Governor, uh, you were a great breath of fresh air with a real-world approach, and uh, let me please encourage you to continue to be active in these issues. Um, I understand that everyone who has wanted to have questions has done so. Um, uh, Mr. Hall, once again, another good hearing. Uh, and uh, if you have no more questions, then we will adjourn this hearing.